to the well. Um, Norway, together with Tunisia and URG, are very pleased to welcome you to uh, this uh, very informal uh, reception uh, to exchange views on religion-based reservation to human rights treaties and what they can tell us about universality, re religion and belief in the 21st century. You're all aware of the discussions ongoing on uh, religion and human rights, on freedom of expression, on extremism, and all the issues that we are discussing down in room 20. Uh, today's reception is uh, a further contribution to this discussion and the reflection on the relationship between religion and human rights. However, we will look at it from another angle than we normally do. The issue can be perceived as uh, rather technical, uh, even if it's among juridical experts, lead to a very impassioned debate. But just a bit about the technical uh, discussion. That is about reservation of to human rights treaties that for some are absolute evil because they cause injury to the integrity to the treaties. For others, they facilitate a broader adhesion and thus facilitate a wider acceptance all the core elements of the treaties in question and therefore serve in the global community interests. Although reservation might, might strengthen, strengthen the universality of human rights, the dominant view among human rights activists is that they endanger the unity and universality of human rights. The rules applicable to reservations contained in the Vienna Convention or the law or treaties prohibits reservations that are incompatible with the object and purpose of a treaty. These rules balance between the prerequisites of universality and the integrity of the treaty. And as we will hear from other speakers today, a number of states have made reservations to human rights treaties on the ground that national law, <coughs> tradition, religion or culture are not congruent with convention principles and purpose to justify the reservation on that basis. Some reservations are drawn so widely that their effect cannot be uh, limited to specific provisions of the Convention. Moreover, several reservations have been formulated in such general terms that other states are prevented from assessing the validity of the reservation. But then, and I'm sure that you are pleased to hear this, the discussion today is about another approach to this discussion. Religion-based reservation is also a lens through which we can identify and understand the deeper theological, local, religious issues that lie in the zone between universal norms and religious doctrine. That makes this discussion so important and real. Human rights are universal. Reservations to core human rights conventions are a hindrance for the reality of this universality. But today, there are also tools to continue our dialogue on how to secure the universality. Special thanks go to the Universal Rights Group for taking this initiative and for working on this issue over a long time and keeping an eye on this difficult issue uh, of religion and of politics. Thank you. And I would like to introduce uh, the Chairman of the Universal Rights Group, Mr. Shahid, please. Thank you, Harriet, uh, for inviting me to the podium. Um, distinguished um, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, friends, colleagues, a very good afternoon to you. And thank you for joining us for this uh, event. The URG, the board of which I am the chair, has identified religion and human rights as one of its four priority areas of focus. And the reasons I think for many of us quite clear. If one looks at what's happening um, in the world at the present time, questions such as religion, belief and human rights, including freedom of religion and expression, are never far from the spotlight. As part of the URG's program on religion and human rights, we are pursuing two linked projects, one that seeks to map and um, understand the political dynamics behind religious-based religion -based reservations, and one that will seek to understand the theological and human rights questions that underpin those reservations. In the context of these projects, URG has recently organized two policy dialogues, 
many of you uh, many of you here have been linked with that one at Tübingen University in Germany and another at Koch University in Turkey uh, today's reception is designed to share with you some of the issues and ideas that came out of those two meetings and we hoped uh, to start more people thinking about these vital questions of human rights religion and how that affects universality our research at URG shows that uh, these decisions have, have a very serious impact. Uh, it shows that of the core nine conventions, six have attracted religious-based uh, reservations. These are the two covenants, plus CEDO, CRC, CAT, and CRPD. Of more than 1,400 normative reservations to these six conventions, our estimate is that 540 or, or more than that are based on religion, belief, um, doctrine, or religious law. That is, around 40% of all reservations are based on religion. For CEDO, over 60% of all reservations to the Convention are based on religion or belief. And for CRC, the, fig for CRC, the figure is 47. Now, at uh, Tobigan, I said that Article 16 of CEDO is the lightning rod for reservations based on religion. That's because it attracts the highest number of reservations for a single article. Now, these our reservations come from states from almost all regions of the world and cover a broad spectrum of religions Christianity, Islam, Judaism and Hinduism among them. Yet despite the large number of states, treaties, treaty articles and religions in question, most reservations focus on a small number of what we might call frontier issues where universal norms meet religious doctrine. And they typically converge on gender equality, inheritance laws, nationality laws, equals in marriage, adoption, freedom of conscience, and apostasy and corporal punishment. That already sounds like a long, long list for anybody who's been uh, counting them. Um, these are often tabled as a compromise between uh, those who seek, those who aspire to universal standards domestically, and those who, those who want to um, uh, adhere to uh, rather patriarchal or rather conservative uh, uh, versions of religious doctrine. And then we have also found that these reservations have not been static. Many countries have moved to modify them or withdraw them uh, quite uh, uh, completely um, as, as their own views on religion itself has evolved through interpretations and interaction with texts or their own uh, uh, commitment to human rights ha have changed over time. Our, views, our, our research shows that over 90 reservations based on religion have been withdrawn or modified over the, um, uh, uh, over the years. And therefore, we believe there is a space for an in interesting conversation, engagement, in the space between religion and uh, 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 universal human rights to see how we can advance a, a discussion on mo moving forward. Today, we have um, distinguished speakers here, quite experienced and expert in, in, in this field. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Walid Dudesh, PR of Tunisia, a country which has quite progressive um, feel like, you know, um, uh, um, take on reservations and have modified or removed some. Uh, Professor Hayna Bellefeld, the UN Rapporteur on Religious Freedom and, and Belief. Dr. Ibrahim Salama, the Chief at the US Chair who looks after treaties. We will hear from them in the order I have uh, uh, mentioned them. May I invite, therefore, uh, Ambassador Walid Dutesh uh, to speak to us uh, for a moment. Thank you very much. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know that I have to uh, start. So, okay, uh, dear friends, uh, I would like uh, to thank you all for uh, being here to participate in uh, the debate on the issue of uh, religion-based reservation to the core human rights convention. I'm glad to be here to share uh, uh, my thoughts on this issue with so many distinguished uh, uh, experts and representatives from different uh, missions in uh, Geneva. At the outset, I would like to mention that uh, Tunisia has ratified 11 international human rights instruments without any reservation or declaration, but has made some reservation and general declaration when ratifying 
the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of Child, and the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of Child on the in Involvement of Children in Armed Conflicts. In fact, the reservation that can be worth considered in relation to our debate today are those concerning the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is uh, known uh, as CEDAW. When notifying the CEDAW in 1985, Tunisia made three reservations, one specific declaration and one general declaration. The reservations concerned to treaty requirement to provide equality to women in family matters. These include passing on their nationality to their children, rights and responsibilities in marriage and divorce, matter relating to children and guardianship, guardianship, personal rights for husbands and wives with regard to family and uh, family name and occupation and ownership of uh, property. It should be underlined that when making these reservations, the government did not justif justify them by referring to religion, but only with respect to the law or the constitution. For example, the reservation to Article 16 of the CEDAW was mentioned in terms indicating that this article should not uh, conflict with personal status code, which is a law adopted in 1956 basically to promote the conditions of women in Tunisia the same year the country got its independence. There is al uh, also another reservation to CEDAW in the form of a general declaration that states that the government shall not take any organization, uh, organizational or legislative decision in conformity with the requirements of this convention where such a decision would conflict with the provision of chapter one of the Tunisian constitution. Here also there is no reference to uh, religion, but you will see that chapter one contains a kind of uh, reference to uh, religion, but it has another meaning when we uh, uh, make it uh, in, when we consider it in relation with uh, article two of the constitution. The reference to chapter one here can be understood as a reference to Article 1 of the Constitution, which states that Tunisia is a free and dependent sovereign state, its religion is Islam, its language Arabic, and its system is Republican. And here we should emphasize the fact that the reference to Islam in Article 1 doesn't mean necessarily reference to Sharia which derives from interpretation by scholars of the way that legislation in Muslim society should be on the basis of the Holy Quran and the practice of the Prophet. And there was a consensus among the members of the National Constitute Assembly that has elaborated the Constitution of January 2014, considering that while Tunisia is an Islamic country, Sharia could not be the source of legislation. This is reflected in the Article 2 of the Chapter 1 of the uh, new Constitution that states that Tunisia is a civil state based on citizenship, the will of the people, and the supremacy of law. So this is very important to make this uh, I mean, uh, uh, consideration when we consider the uh, reference to Islam and uh, the, uh, when making the reservation uh, uh, regarding the CEDAW, uh, uh, and I talked earlier about this uh, uh, general declaration. So here, when we consider the chapter one, it should not be uh, considered only with reference to Article uh, Article one of the chapter one of the Constitution, which refers to Islam, but also to Article two, which uh, refers also to the fact that Tunisia is uh, a state based on citizenship, the will of the people, and the supremacy of law. In my view, this is, when considering these two articles, one and two, referring the first uh, the article one to Islam and the uh, second one to the will of the people and the supremacy of law, in, the, in my view, this is how Tunisia manages to avoid any contradiction between having a modern and free society and in the same token, 
consider itself as a Muslim country. This can be seen in the content of its constitution, which recognizes the highest principle, uh, principles of universal human rights, the separation and balance of power, and equality between male and female. And we can say also that it is thanks to this spirit prevailing in Tunisia today that the government withdrew recently these reservations because we said that we have three reservations, one uh, declaration and one general declaration, so the three reservation and the uh, declaration and was uh, withdrawn. But uh, the declaration, uh, the general declaration uh, remained. So uh, declaration concerns it though, with maintaining the general declaration we mentioned it earlier. In this context, we'd like also to underscore the evolving aspect of the commitment of Tunisia to CEDAW. Actually, the reservation to CEDAW was made in 1985. At that time, Tunisia was considered as a liberal Arab and Muslim country. Today, and after the revolution, the government withdrew most of these reservations. It should be considered as an important evolution and come in conformity of the Article 46 of the new constitution that states until earlier that the state commits to protect women's accrued rights and work to strengthen and develop those rights. The recent withdrawal of reservation to CEDAW shows the progressive process through which the commitment of Tunisia to the provision of this convention has been undertaken so far. We should stress in this context also that Tunisia adherence to women's rights has its root, roots back in old history rich of very important and diversified civilization that flourished in Tunisia and contributed to the enrichment of the heritage of mankind. This, herit this historical heritage helped create a reformist movement started in the second half of the 19th century and has made the Tunisian revolution possible in 2011 and gave its strength to survive today. And I believe that this, is, this reformist movement will continue to pave the way for a better future for the Tunisians, especially women. In conclusion, I think it is important to consider reservation as a way to widen the international adherence to human rights conventions. On the other hand, religion cannot be considered, in my point of view, as an obstacle to the universality of human rights when there is a strong and genuine commitment to those rights. I thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, let me thank the organizers for having brought us together. Congratulations to the Universal Rights Group. Uh, Ahmed, to you personally also, not only for the event, but also for the study you have undertaken on this issue, which is a very specific one, but also a very broad one. I think it really is a, gives us a lens through which to consider a broad variety of issues, but in a, a new and innovative way. Thank you very much. Uh, I have divided my remarks into three points. And the first point is on religion and human rights. So my mandate is not the mandate on religion. Sometimes, I mean, we have these short hands. It's not the mandate on religion. It's the mandate on freedom of religion or belief, which is different. But nonetheless, I take the liberty of, uh, of saying a few words on the relationship between, or facets of the relationship between human rights and religion. And uh, here, I mean, uh, the, the, the trivial truth, which I want to point out, because sometimes trivialities have to be reiterated, I'm doing it all the time, now, human rights themselves are not a religion. I do believe in human rights. Nonetheless, human rights is not a comprehensive belief system comparable to religions. And we should not uh, misperceive uh, human rights as a sort of religion civile internationale, sometimes I do come across such misunderstandings. Also in academic literature, sometimes in political rhetoric, 
um, I think this would be uh, not only an, a, a misunderstanding, it would create a lot of confusion. No, human rights are not a religion. They are legally binding norms uh, and also a epitomizing the normative awareness of the international community, their main source is respect for human dignity. And that is, of course, I mean, that turns these rights, which are rights, uh, legal instruments, at the same time into moral demands. So human rights are rights, but they are not well, any sort of rights, but they have a certain moral persuasiveness, human dignity, which also, yeah, it resonates with uh, deeply with many religious traditions. But then the consequences we, we now, nowadays d uh, draw from institutionalizing respect for human dignity are also different from religious traditions. Uh, let me quote, uh, it's actually my favorite quote, you know it, uh, the first sentence of the preamble of the UDHR, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. So the inalienability of human rights, that is, I mean, the uh, moral persuasiveness, but then also equality. Equality in rights. Equality between men and women. Also between religious minorities, ma minor, uh, majorities. I mean, equality really as one of the architectural principles. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's something that only arose in the modern era, but oh, I mean, to have this as a legally binding principle is something pretty new. And also then a source for complications, to use a rather innocent word uh, that might arise between religious traditions and human rights. This was my first point. So it's, uh, are, there are complications. Uh, we should not uh, postulate uh, uh, a harmony from the beginning. I think that's not sustainable. But uh, always work on the assumption um, we, it's different categories. Human rights are not a religion or quasi-religion or religion civile of a modern type in itself. It's different. My second point, and now more specifically on reservations. Uh, I would in fact say uh, that reservations can never be ideal, and that is again innocent language. Um, it can never be ideal, so uh, endorsing human rights, endorsing also the legal element of human rights, so international ratification should lead to full endorsement. I mean, that is of course the goal. And uh, sometimes, okay, we cannot reach it, uh, and then, okay, one can make certain allowances, but I would say they are temporary. I, I would never be satisfied with uh, uh, reservations, uh, because then also the various reservations that we have on, uh, on the global scale mean, I mean, there's always a lack of transparency, a lack of clarity, a lack of unity. Uh, so for human rights to unfold their force, their legal force, but also their moral persuasiveness. Yeah, I mean, reservations create a problem. Uh, and uh, that is even more the case if these reservations are very broad. If they refer to core obligations, I mean, how can you ratify CEDAW and at the same time exclude Article 16, family life? What remains? What remains? I have my doubts. That, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when uh, these reservations concern core elements, then it's even more problematic. And, and, and then uh, when uh, reservations uh, prevent also prevent us and prevent human rights advocates to be really fully specific also in dealing with equality issues, emancipation, between men and women, but also children. We know, I mean, we heard it also from Ahmed in his brief introduction, that the reservations, and in particular those uh, made with reference to religion, uh, particularly affect CEDO and CRC. So it is really something that remains disturbing, and we should not gloss over that. The good news also from the findings is, and we heard it uh, just now also from the ambassador of Algeria, uh, 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 Tunisia, sorry, uh, that uh, there is also change and that uh, reservations, I mean the temporarity of reservations has been proven by states lifting reservations, removing reservations, uh, fine-tuning things. Uh, 
uh, based on more clarity, maybe also new interpretations of religious sources, sometimes also women taking a more active role in the interpretation of religious sources, feminist theology, I mean, that's also, including queer theology. Uh, these are interesting trends, but also, I mean, the work of clarification has to be done on all sides, also on the side of human rights. Also here, interpretive clarity, I think, really is important. It helps. My third and last point, now more specifically, freedom of religion. I started with religion. Freedom. I mean, why is the mandate that I am blessed with, maybe, may I, I use that <laughs> loaded uh, language, uh, why is it not called uh, the mandate on religion? I think it has a deeper significance because if you take religion seriously, and I do take it seriously, as part of the human dimension, of the human condition, you will, of course, realize religion only exists in the plural. Religions, beliefs, the various beliefs. The more deeply you go into this, the more you will uh, realize uh, there are even irreconcilable differences. What is sacred for one may be totally incomprehensible for another. That's why when it comes to providing legal protection, human rights have that element of providing legal protection. You cannot provide legal protection to religions. Not in a consistent way. You have to single out some at the expense of others. That's why, I mean, the common denominator that allows us also to come up with legal protection is the human being. The human being holding beliefs of various kinds. The human being practicing beliefs, religions, deep convictions, existential convictions of various kinds. So, I mean, that is the common denominator which allows us to really also <coughs> provide legal protection. That's why the human being is the right holder. It does not mean subscribing to an anthropocentric worldview. I mean, this is not about worldviews. It's not a comprehensive belief system, but I mean, the element of legal protection must be there. And freedom of religion or belief has the same logic as any other human right. It protects human beings, human beings more specifically in this dimension, in their human beings in their deep existential, profound conviction, identity-shaping convictions, and conviction-based practices. It's a very practical right. That's why human beings having that status of right holders, I always find it disturbing per se if states enter reservations by referring to religion. How can states do that? I'm really wondering. It's a serious question. Uh, based on the assumption human beings are the right holders, also in the field of freedom of religion or belief, yes, I think there is a problem. If states take it into their hands to enter reservations in order to promote specific religious identities, which also always means singling out certain traditions, um, I have a problem with reservations generally. I uh, do share what was said earlier. We are live in, a re in the real world and so sometimes we have to, to, to look for the second best solutions and that's why reservations, declarations is part of it. I'm never fully satisfied, so as a human rights advocate, but more specifically also coming from my mandate, freedom of religion or belief, I have an additional uh, reason to be doubtful about the sustainability of reservations in which then religion is invoked by states. That's why I think it's good to discuss. It's also, I'm always discussing in a listening mode, trying to understand better. Uh, that we need clarity, and clarity is only possible on the basis of communication. Having talked so long, I will now turn to the listening mode. Thank you very much. Uh, me too, I'm grateful for the Universal Rights Group, to you, Ahmed, personally, and to the organizers for this opportunity. In fact, I don't know how many of us realize, but, but the two events, and it's rare that I attend two events back-to-back -back in uh, Tübingen and Istanbul, it was time very well spent. And I think these discussions, uh, in addition to the number of side events or discussions or resolutions or 
during this council that invoked religion one way or another uh, provide an indicator that, that the issue is no longer neglected the same way. I fully understand the, the, the legitimacy of the reasons why so many people try to avoid the issues of religion uh, uh, when it comes to human rights by very legitimate and well-founded fear of relativism in the name of religion. I share uh, uh, perfectly your uh, intellectual uh, uh, shock at the idea of even uh, reservations in the name of religion, states depriving individuals from the rights on behalf of God. So the first observation that I think we take it for granted when we talk about religions is that nobody can talk about religions, philosophically even. It's human interpretations of religions. And I think the practice and the Tunisian case show us that these interpretations vary in time and space, and they develop with time, which is natural, and this is a very good thing in itself. So this is the first ob double observation. Religions are being considered as an actor and a factor that impacts as a, as a fact of society, part of identity, and also as a political tool at times. Uh, predominantly at times, uh, it becomes a, a political tool. Just an anecdotal example that I know uh, best from Egypt uh, under the regime of Mubarak, when the last period of the regime and they were trying to improve the image in terms of human rights, so they use the notion in Islamic law, which is al khola in order to allow women the same right to divorce. And when there was a very strong opposition in the parliament, if it was a televised uh, sessions of the parliament, the members of parliament were objecting for a simple reason. Because of political corruption, they were putting their properties in the name of their wives. So if the wife has the right to divorce herself, they lost everything, the money and the wife. And they were saying it. So uh, starting from that onwards, you find how much religions are being misused and I think it shouldn't be tolerated when people speak on behalf of religion automatically that they have something sacred that they are presenting. So I think this in itself is a, is a very good trend. Very quickly some thoughts that I uh, take from uh, these two uh, 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 very important events. Um, it was interesting to meet in, in, in Tübingen, uh, you remember uh, Heine, uh, a Norwegian PhD student who just finished his PhD and it was about the practice of treaty body experts and rapporteurs in terms of uh, using or invoking or dealing with faith-based organizations and religious actors. And interestingly enough, it was CRC and SIDU, the most users of this in their concluding observations, precisely because of what you said, that the impact is much more high on uh, children rights and, and women rights. So I think that the treaty bodies and the rapporteurs were ahead of the intergovernmental uh, uh, discourse in terms of recognizing, albeit without a conscious, thoughtful discussion, but the, 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 the facts dictated the need to address the religious authorities and, non and, and faith based organizations and the non-state actors who also have responsibilities in the area of, of human rights. Personally, and as a Muslim, as a personal view, I, I do not accept at all any uh, 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 reservations or relativism in the name of religion. The only particularities that I personally, as a Muslim, can accept are those who, that add to the international level of protection, being the minimum common standard of humanity, to quote another, uh, the UDHR. So for me, it doesn't bother me at all. It's, I know that it's about only human interpretations that are being politically manipulated to justify violence and to gain political ground predominantly in the name of religion. But you can only reach that conclusion and convince and not, don't leave it a chasse garde for the manipulators only if you accept to address the issue. Uh, again, I understand the, hes the hesitations at an intergovernmental level to invoke religion, but I have never heard of a problem that improved because of ignoring it. To the contrary. I think it leaves the issue. So there is a trend, there is a change in this, uh, in, in this direction which I find, uh, I find useful. Secondly, I think that uh, the level to which religions have been misused as a political shield from the personal uh, uh, situations, the, the, the authority between the couple to the political level at the national level to the international level, that we can only think of a negative role of religion when it comes to human rights. What these two events, and I will spare you the examples because I would take many long time, and I'm very happy that there will be a report about the events because this shows to which extent religions can become also a positive factor in terms of enhancing human rights and uh, um, adding to the international protection. CRC refers to al kafala which is a, an Islamic concept in terms of uh, the, the equivalent to, to adoption, for instance. Uh, and it has an added protective value 
uh, in the society. And this is not the only example for many other religions and for many other uh, uh, example one can find that religion can play a role. How to maximize the potential positive and avoid the political misuse is an issue that we can only uh, uh, understand if we address it first uh, uh, and foremost. Are there roles for religious authority? I think increasingly there are bits and pieces of flashes of where they, they have to be uh, to meet these uh, responsibilities. And, um, and uh, again, the number of side events that invoke this is, 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 is really impressive. Um, one thing which is shocking for me, I don't know how many of us have discussed human rights issues with religious authorities, but the notion that they have about human rights is predominantly so negative beyond what you can imagine. Uh, so the, the relationship is it's vice versa. It's exactly reciprocal, reciprocal misunderstanding or misuse or, or, or political manipulation. Uh, I think religious authorities have a lot to learn and have a lot to gain if uh, human rights issues are introduced into their own thinking. I was very surprised to see at Tübingen a center of Islamic theology that is preparing um, a common curriculum, a methodology to teach uh, theology uh, across all religions. So it's not an Islamic theology, it's not a Christian theology, um, and it's very working in practice. We don't know much about this, but I think the fact that uh, uh, academic debates and, and think tanks like the URG are, are opening these horizons uh, and through their own reports injecting this into the intergovernmental discussions is a very positive trend that I hope will have the food very soon. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to all our speakers. Uh, if we have time for some questions and answers, if, if anybody, or some comments, if anybody wants to do that, or unless you want to head back to your meetings. Okay, uh, so let me therefore, if there are no questions and comments anybody wishes to make. Let's, okay. I would just like to know a little bit about Tunisia. What kind of religious education they give in their mother's house? Tunisia? Tunisia. Would the ambassador want to respond to that? Yeah. I, I didn't hear uh, your what question, please. What kind of textbooks uh, you use in your mother's house? Textbook? Yeah, what, what textbook? Do you use Saudi textbooks, for instance? No, no, no. Uh, we have our scholars, we have our... You know, this is... You can uh, link it to the history of Tunisia. Mm -hmm. You know, the first... Uh, uh, I mean, Muslim... who who arrived to Africa, they uh, arrived in the, 70, uh, in the 7th century, yes. you know, and they started there, uh, the scholarship of, and but in the, uh, you can say in the 90s, there, there, there are a lot of uh, religious people, a lot of uh, thoughts uh, of religion, and the most important thing is, at, uh, since the 19th century, they started a reformist uh, movement to consider religion not in the view of uh, people coming from the, uh, I mean, uh, what is now Saudi Arabia or from the, uh, uh, any other uh, thoughts, I mean, religious thoughts. It was a, a genuine Tunisian reformist movement that started in the 19th and it is still, uh, I mean, developing. So uh, uh, it is uh, various, but what is important is to uh, uh, say that there was a reformist movement which has its own uh, interpretation of religion, and this is what helped now Tunisia to have this kind of, I mean, uh, uh, way of understanding religion and not to understand it in contradiction with uh, human rights in general. So, uh, and this is how also to, uh, that we managed to make progress. I mean, to make uh, there is kind of evolving uh, I mean, situation in Tunisia with regard to human rights in general. So. And we consider still, and the main party now in Tunisia, the religious party, it is uh, based, the, uh, his uh, I mean, uh, principle is equality, uh, freedom, and uh, I mean, modernity, and modernism. So, and they think that uh, there is no uh, contradiction between religion and human rights. And they defend strongly human rights. So, and this is how we, get, we got this uh, constitution without their approval of what is in constitution, which is, uh, contain, uh, contains uh, very high uh, I mean, uh, standards of international human rights I mean, principle. So uh, without their approval, uh, this constitu constitution could not uh, be uh, elaborated and adopted. Many, many Muslim societies in 
Saudis are looking for non-Saudi uh, yes. textbooks. Yes. Is it possible to get hold of the Tunisian textbooks to see if they are better and no, it's 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 up to you. I mean, it's up to you. If you choose this Saudi, you can choose. If you if you want to choose this Tunisian, you can choose them. So, it's 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 uh, it's also part of your your freedom of of belief of thoughts. You choose the way you 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 think that is uh, best for you. Okay, thank you. We take one more question, yeah. Jane. I think it's Is it for me too? Oh, no, no? no. <laughs> it's just a comment. Okay. Um, I attended the Istanbul meeting, as you know, and I've done quite a lot of work on um, reservations to CEDAW. And I think it's important when you're looking at these reservations to be very careful with the phrase religion based reservations. Because, a good example, Monaco, Bahamas, and um, Tunisia and Egypt had reservations to Article 9 of CEDAW, which is about citizenship. This is about the patriarchy. It's nothing to do with religion. So when you're classifying, you may want to be a little, little less, you know, sort of, this is religious, this is not religious. And um, Bahamas still has that. So very, very, it's a very good point, actually. Uh, there is a lot of confusion even when you make reservations. Uh, I come from the Maldives, where I was involved in sometimes making them, modifying them and removing them. So I've yeah. seen the whole process from various perspectives. This issue, nationality, uh, Sharia has no concept of citizenship in it. It's just added on from, I suppose, European engagement with these lands, and therefore it becomes a male uh, transmitted uh, uh, patriarchy, absolutely. Um, I think we might want to wrap up at this point. I want to thank all of you for being here and for the speakers for enlightening us with their insightful uh, comments. Um, before I end, however, I want to add that in my own country, I, gr I grew up with the laws and everybody arguing that women can't be leaders in a Muslim, in a Muslim country. By the time we grew up, well, the beliefs changed. So, in other words, there is always space for evolution, space for change. There is no one common Sharia reading anywhere. It keeps on changing all the time. As Ibrahim said, you know, there is nothing that is sort of not flexible here. So, I believe there is scope for us to engage in rational discussions to see how the legal approach uh, can uh, offer protections to individuals and their human rights rather than religions and more abstract uh, notions that don't actually have right ent entitlements. So thank you very much for being here. I look forward to further engagement with you on this and other subjects as you move along. Thank you very much.